this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Wherever you find us, whether it's a video or podcast on your favorite platform, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. You can also find us on major social media platforms. If you go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com, you can find links to the videos or MP3 files, which you can download and enjoy without commercial interruptions. If you're into classic horror, ghost, and adventure stories, I narrate Nightshade Diary, and you can find links at nightshadediary.com. If scary stories are your bag, and listening to encounters with cryptids, ghost, dogmen, and other weird creatures sends a shiver up your spine, then go to supernaturalstorytime.com for links to our weekly podcasts. Noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird can be found at eerie.news or visit the Stranger Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Please subscribe to my newsletter on Substack. Just go to mppelliser.com for a link. I want to thank you for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi, how's everybody doing? Good, I hope. I'm doing good. Everything here in North Florida is doing good. Some rainy weather, but that's deal with that i can deal with that um besides that you know some you know how they say sometimes no news is good news sometimes you know it's good to to just be like <laughs> no nothing exciting because yeah it's um it tends to throw people off when things get crazy but uh no so that's why i'm saying everything is good it's like it's the way it should be yeah what can i say i'm a i'm a creature of habit and um yeah. And I'll, but I'll tell you something, though. It's really weird to talk about PTSD. And I, and I know maybe some people caught it on my earlier show. I had one of my very old, this was, I want to say this tree was estimated to be between three, five, maybe as much as 500 years old. And about a month ago, somebody had noticed, because the trunk was huge, somebody had said, hey, it looks like it has a crack. And I looked at it and I said, and by the way, this thing was in the middle of my property. And I said, God, has that crack always been there? And I just overlooked it. It's one of those things that you kind of like, you're not really sure. It's like, maybe it's been there. And I just, you know, when you see something so many times, you just don't see it anymore. Well, <laughs> apparently that crack, I was should have been paying attention. But to be honest with you, I, I don't think I would have known what to do anyway. About a month ago, and I mentioned this, that oak came crashing down and it came like it felt like an earthquake i had i have a neighbor who was clearing some land and when i heard it cracking i thought god what's he doing until and i was on my back porch all of a sudden the cracking that it made sounded like end of the world kind of stuff apocalyptic this thing came crashing down damaged my chicken coop but a chicken survived believe it or not but Getting to the point of my story, I've gotten like a little bit of PTSD about it because I have another huge uh, oak. Part of it is over my home on the end. As a matter of fact, where I'm sitting right now. And lately when, you know, we get like a little, little bit of stormy weather, even though, by the way, that, that tree came down, it was not stormy. It was not raining. It was not windy. Around here, winds, yeah, you'll get an occasional branch that'll come down. But I'm, I'm realizing that I'm here and if, all of a sudden I'm looking out my window and it gets stormy where I'll see the wind like pick up. I start wigging out a little bit because I witnessed that tree going down and it really made like this, you don't realize these things. I mean, yeah, I wigged out right then and there, obviously, but you know, I got somebody to come and chop it up and take it away and whatever, but you don't understand the effects of witnessing things like this till later on. In situations like this where I'm like, okay, is one of these branches from this huge tree, which is, there's a tree, another tree there, which is just as old. By the way, all I, and, and, and you start extrapolating, you know, talk about catastrophic theory, thinking the worst case scenario. I don't even need that tree. I just need a couple of those branches because these branches overhead are huge to drop on and that's, that's it, Marlene, it's over. So, and thank God it's not over where I sleep. But it's really weird the way the mind will work 
where, you know, I think it's like, yeah, I think it's going to take me a while to just get beyond that and realize that my trees aren't out to get me. But anyway, let's get on to the good part. And the good part is who the guest is tonight. This gentleman's been here before in Stories of the Supernatural, and I'm sure many of you will be familiar with him. He's very well known in the ufology field. His name is Daryl Slims. He's the alien hunter, and he is the world's leading expert on alien abductions. He has over 38 years of field research, having focused on physical evidence that led to his groundbreaking discoveries of alien implants and alien, alien fluorescence. He's a former military police officer and CIA operative. Uh, he's acquired a unique insight into the alien organization, which he believes functions similarly to an intelligence agency. Uh, Daryl's also a compassionate and skilled therapist, who has helped hundreds of alien experiencers all over the world come to terms with what they witnessed. Talk about PTSD. Help me welcome him. How are you doing today, Daryl? Uh, absolutely wonderful. It's great to be here. So we have we haven't talked for a few years and right before we started to record i told you a lot of things have been happening in the last couple of years um you know that have made the news and sometimes there's a lot of thing a lot of things that go on that never make the news what uh have you had any unusual cases or anything lately as far as reports that have come into you well we uh, we actually have we've got uh, probably another uh three cases of uh alien implantation that appears to be quite real and uh, substantial with good evidence. That's uh, that's happened very recently. And uh, more probably to the point, I've got a European tour starting in the, at the end of August and uh, goes from Scotland to Manchester, England, to uh, Istanbul, Turkey, uh, Gobekli Tepe, Karan Tepe, Cappadocia, and several other little places. And then they're going to have me back next month after that for a major uh conference in uh in istanbul and i'll be the keynote speaker for that you know that's really i'm glad you mentioned that because we hear so much obviously about cases that happen here in the united states but you very seldomly hear about cases of alien abductions in europe or in in the middle east any of those countries that you just mentioned very rarely do you hear that and but obviously things are going on there. Um, let me ask you, in your experience, do some of these people realize that they have an implant either because of recovered memories, nightmares, or do that they actually feel something like in their body or under their skin? That's really a great question. And the reason I say that is because the uh, implantation that, uh, which are re actually quite rare, and I, I get, I, I bet you I get at least three calls or um inquiries uh, per week uh asking you know telling me that they have an implant and of course i asked how do you know that and so on they uh, usually give answers that are not correct and uh the fact is that implants are so extremely rare and most of these people the ones that we do find them in uh they don't they don't know they have them there's no there's no side effects or like you no know, like a aliens got me or they do this or did that or you know it, it, the easiest scenario that someone might come up with would be the aliens but took me and they were doing something in my ear or in my nasal passage and i i don't know what they were doing and i'll have them go and get an x-ray of the area the affected area or suspected area and uh, that sometimes will yield uh, an implant as an illustration but generally speaking, most of the time they don't know. It's a, usually a doctor or someone else who finds this in them and wonders, what in the world is that? And why is it there? Like a checkup kind of deal, and all of a sudden they come across like something weird. That's, I'm that's sure very that true. The, the doctors want to, they're not thinking implant. They're thinking, okay, is it organic? Is something you know wrong with this person? Well, a good example, we have one, uh, one of our cases, in, uh, ladies in the medical field, and uh, uh, very well educated, very sharp, uh, doesn't, is not a groupie on about aliens and this sort of thing. She just has these experiences, and she finally called me, and, and she said, I was going to talk to several other people, but I realized after I read over your information, probably you're the one I ought to be talking to. We've been talking now for about two years. 
and she's got two objects in her leg, and these objects are, uh, she found them accidentally, by the way, again, just uh, from her UFO event, but not directly related, and the doctor just happened to x-ray her foot and leg, and lo and behold, there's two objects in there that make no sense whatsoever, and there's no scarring, there's no anything, there they are. To let me ask you, when people get the implants removed, like you said, they don't notice it or feel anything different. In other words, but once they're removed, that people reported something different in them that now they realize there's that something was producing some type of effect. The uh, the fact is, the truth of the matter is, most of these people, uh, and and it, the answer to that really goes back to the issue what does an alien implant do to you? And the answer is nothing that you probably know about. Uh, that's why uh, people have had implants as many as 40 years and they had no idea they had it in there. Like one lady, uh, she had a splinter in her foot and her doctor, of course, wanted her to spend more money. He said, well, we need to take an x-ray of that. And uh, of a simple splinter that got uh, inflamed. And he says, what in the world are those three metal objects in the top of your foot? She said, what are you talking about? He said, that looks like something from an osteotomy. And she says, I've never had a surgery in my life. What are you talking about? So she never knew all this time, didn't have any effects or knowledge about it after the fact. So this was uh, very stunning to her. Um, and they turned out to be, uh, from a, an intelligence point of view and from a uh, uh, from a, a scientific point of view, medical point of view, uh, was absolutely astounding. I mean, they they turned out to be three objects from a rare meteorite in outer space. What? I mean, that's how impossible is that? Yes. Nobody steps on rare meteorites from outer space. It doesn't happen. I was about to ask you that. I said, usually what, what are they made of? What material are they made of? But in this case, you're saying it's a meteorite. Well, okay. Even from my point of view, uh, what was more stunning was the medical part of it. The medical part showed the objects were hid in a biological cocoon. And this biological encasement, uh, this cocoon, uh, hid the metal objects from the body so the body never knew that the objects were even there. It, it didn't recognize them as foreign objects and attack them as it normally Right, did. exactly, right, because the body would have, you know, maybe, like, given her inflammation or, you know, things that the body does to let you know that there's something foreign inside inside of you. Yeah, it, uh, it, it hit it so well that uh, a, a Nobel laureate told me, he said, Mr. Sims, he said, if you could replicate that biology in the laboratory, you may have a Nobel laureate find already. He said... Organ donor rejection would be passe after that. You, yeah. It would be incredible. So I said, well, what laboratory do you suspect I should uh, send those off to, to, to be studied? And he laughed and said, not any of them. And I laughed and I said, I was born in Texas and I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. I think I'll w wait until I find the, the appropriate person. Right. In other words, he's telling you, that's my recommendation, but that's as far as it goes. <laughs> well, they'll steal your, steal your tech uh, immediately and uh, slice off a couple of microns and hand you back the original stuff. You won't even know they've got the other stuff. And miraculously, in 10 years, they'll come up with a new and non-inflammatory process uh, developed by the human body. Yeah, I believe it. God, you know how much money that would be worth? A lot. Yes, especially to them. Of course. Of course. I mean... That's one of the things you always hear about as far as transplants is the trying to match up people to donors so that there's no rejection. That's like a, one of the mm -hmm. biggest risks, you know, if they, if they could bypass that. Wow. That's right. That would be, that would be incredible as far as, but it, that's, did she, and she had, did she have any idea about place? Could they, in other words, oh, I'm thinking that's right. That's one of those things. If you've never gotten hurt and you've never had a need for an x-ray, God knows how long you can have something in that area of your body without ever knowing about it. Based on the UFO stories that she told, the history of her ufology, mm -hmm. uh, it would seem that the implants were in there about 40 years. And uh, they, in my opinion, were passe 
old uh, old text, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the newer stuff, I think, is a little different. But in, in this particular case, what also medically was amazing to me <clears throat> was inside the cocoon where the metal objects were, <clears throat> there was a biological mechanism going on, so to speak, that, that was referred to as a proteinaceous coagulum, which is a fancy way of saying that a bunch of protein in a, a coagulated in such a way that it seemed to be a self uh, protecting or self uh, modulating situation. And uh, we ultimately don't know what that specifically was for, but it seemed to be uh, if it was if it was communicating with the body or uploaded or downloaded by the alien, so to speak, at different times, that would be uh, certainly would be a, a mechanism that would be worthwhile suggesting that. Right, like a Trojan horse kind. Of. And, and this is the thing because you always think of, in other words, one thing is when you think of the abduction somebody getting abducted and examined. And of course, they have the information that they have. But when you hear of the implants, you're thinking, okay, they want to monitor the person and, and, the, and the body, even though you really don't know if that monitoring can also include emotional states. We, I imagine we're really not sure. But at the very least, they want to monitor this person for X amount of years, which, by the way, anybody that does studies will tell you long-term studies are the most valuable those are the ones that give you the best finds as far as um you know results is uh if you have x amount of participants <laughs> that you can track for years if possible those are the That's, best studies and it's i guess the aliens think the same thing too that that makes sense it, uh, it actually makes sense yeah that, that do you think that you know, what was it, uh, like a, was it a month ago or more or less, they had come across another set of cattle mutilations out on um, and this highway in Texas. And they looked in like in that month, like in a five or six week spread, they have found similar cattle mutilations along the same highway, different counties in Texas, but they followed that same highway. Do you yes, think, I, re I remember that event, yes. Right. And um, do you think that, do you think it's aliens that are doing the cattle mutilations? Well, uh, at, 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 I was asked this question by one of the first people that got a lot of this stuff started over 40 years ago. His name was, uh, he's a police officer at the time. His name was uh, Charles uh, Oliphant. And, uh, and anyway, he asked me this question. And he, his view was that the, uh, the military was doing these. And I told him that, I uh, said, well, you're about half right. And he said, well, I want to know your opinion. I said, okay. And then he, I began to, I, I told him that I thought there were at least four different types of mutilations going on. And uh, I said, that's not my field, but I've been looking at it. And this is the conclusion that I've come to at this point. And he says, well, who do you think's doing it? And I said, well, uh, them i pointed upward and he said who's that and i said the alien and he said uh, okay and i said the second group would be the intelligence community is he doing the military i said no i said pay attention here i said the intelligence community i said then this third group or or in my opinion or much a rarer group a very rare group and these are people who admire the alien to no end and will go to great lengths to make themselves known and they, in fact they think all abductees and contactees are a bunch of idiots and that if the aliens would really contact them personally well they would show them that the, what humans are truly like and how far more advanced they are than than the rest of us so to speak you know our vibrations are much too low and i just laugh at that whole mentality i met a scientist one time who actually wanted me to take one I of her implants and re-implant it in fans. him he wanted the implant reinserted in him. Oh. I said, you mean so that he, in fact, I met him on the airplane on the way back from the first surgery. I told him what I did. And he said, you need to reinsert that into someone. I said, do you have somebody in mind? He said, yeah, me. And I laughed and I said, uh, you're an advanced level Rosicrucian. How do you know that? And I said, it doesn't matter. Answer the question. 
aren't you? And he said, yes. And I said, you got this idea that you're just a little above, cut above everybody else. And, and uh, you ought to be the one the aliens are communicating with, not the clowns uh, like us down here. And he said, well, he said, I'm a scientist. And I, I said, they know more than you do, and they could care less what you know. It doesn't matter. You know, he was a Rosa Grusha, Daryl. Well, I'm pretty good at uh, picking out people, especially people who miraculously find me and find me <laughs> useful. <Okay. laughs> No, those coincidences, huh? Is that what you're saying? Well, I used I used to be in the intelligence community, and lying and telling the truth is one of the things I've learned quite well. I can usually do that pretty well with a person sitting there talking to them and tell you what part of the brain they're accessing while they're mumbling on about whatever they're talking about. Well, you know, and the reason why I asked is that I was looking at that, and they said that, you know, because a lot of times you'll, you'll have people say, well, the cattle are sick, and and there was this one batch where they, you know, they did the necropsy and they sent off the tissue. In other words, none of the cattle were sick. All right. Yes. And they've also found that in the blood system barbiturates, which is weird. You know, you usually don't find those in cattle, you know. So it's almost like they're they're dosing these animals, which is why they don't struggle, supposedly, for all these incisions. And on top of it. All the parts that they take, when you ask a butcher, are they, they're the least valuable part of a, of, a, of a cow, you know, as far as, the you know, not meat, you know, all these parts that they take, the tongue, you know, the eyeballs, the genital area, whatever, those normally are the, you know, it's not even that you can say, well, somebody butchering up uh, cattle for, you know, so all the usual things that you would think of why somebody would slaughter an animal don't hold water but at the same time i always think okay how many times how many cows do you have to kill what are you trying to figure out there's something there that's like i don't want to say if it's a decoy or distracting or i don't know i don't know what to call it well maybe i can help your audience out a little bit with this okay. uh, the uh the when the when the intelligence community does that for in my opinion first of all i told the cop i said uh I said, I, I think the alien is the one that's primarily responsible. And he, he argued with me. He said, no, it's the, it's the military. And I said, I keep telling you it's not the military. It's the intelligence community. They're running the operation. And he finally says, well, you're wrong. And I said, no, I'm right, actually. I said, uh, it's both of them. They're, and one's watching the other. And uh, he said, well, I think you're wrong. And I said, well, okay. I said, uh, I'm an ex-cop. I said, uh, he said, you got a case, make it. And I said, all right. I said, don't make me embarrass you in front of God and everyone else here. He says, do it. And I said, okay. I said, there's tons of meat. And this is a this is well-known case. Uh, tons of meat fell from the sky. Tons of meat. Different types of animals. But the one of the most interesting was it was human meat. Sliced. Hearts, lungs, etc. I said, now... That happened in the 1880s. Who in the CIA do you think did that? And he got real quiet. And I said, I said, when you're asking me questions, uh, but my friend, I said, don't tell me the answer and, and expect me to sit there and agree with you when I know better. I said, this stuff's been going on a lot, lot longer than you and I are, are old. And uh, I said, I'm telling you, they're, the intelligence community has been spying on the alien for a long time. And uh, sometimes they pick up cattle that already have been marked. He said, what are you talking about? I said, cattle that have been pre-marked. He said, like what? I said, some of your cattle have been marked uh, before. I said, you discovered that, you and uh, uh, this uh, doctor that was working with you at the time. I said, he said, what color? And so I told him, he said, Oh my God, how did you figure that out? And I said, well, I am an next cop. I think I can know, I know how to investigate things. I can figure stuff out. And I said, but that's okay. Don't worry about it. I said, our cattle are marked too. He said, are you talk, telling me the abductees have got fluorescence on them too? And I said, uh, many of them, yeah, from their events. He said, is there a pattern? I said, yes. Is, is there a difference in coloration? I said, yes. And he says, oh my God. And then he got excited. I said, but 
I said, let's go back to the, the intelligence community. I said, we've investigated cases, uh, like one of the cases we did was quite interesting. And in, um, this was up in uh, uh, Oregon year, many years ago, back in the 90s. I said, in that case, we suspected that it was the intelligence com in the community. And of course, everybody's found a dead cow and all this and mutilated and so on. And they so they said, well, you know, all the blood's gone from it and everything. I said, well, no, that's not completely true. Most of the blood is missing. It, it, blood will pool in the bottom of the cow. And if you want a blood sample, you're going to have to turn the cow over and, you know, and get a blood sample there. But anyway, no, all the blood's gone. I said, no, it isn't. You're misleading people when you say that. Most of the blood is missing. And so anyway, uh, I said, we found, uh, we took a samples from uh, 10 foot away from the cow in all directions, north, south, east, and west, and every 10 feet to, uh, out to about 150 feet. He said, well, they said, well, why would you do that? And I said, because what we found was uh, human pharmaceuticals that were in those areas in, a, in concentric rings f further out. He said, well, what does that tell you? And I said, well, that tells me those are human pharmaceuticals and our guys were using the pharmaceuticals themselves. Now, the question is, who's what came first, chicken or the egg? Did the aliens catch the, uh, the cow to begin with? And then something happened and they wanted to find out what they were doing or, you know, or, or do they, are they, they doing their own work? And he said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, the intelligence community, particularly in the area of Dulce, uh, they asked the Native Americans there, and I've been to Dulce a number of times and spoken at their conferences at the, on the reservation there. And uh, I said, the, years ago, back in, I think, the 60s, the intelligence community through the, through the DOD asked the big question, can we uh, explode a small nuclear weapon underground on the res? And they said, no. And so the the intelligence committee just went off the res outside the reservation some distance and did, planted one underground and it exploded anyway. Well, the point of that is a lot of the cattle started getting caught and mutilated and other things uh, in that area. And of course, everybody thought, well, it's aliens or whatever. But the fact is, it's more than likely the intelligence committee and they're checking the water supply to see what's contaminated and guess what eats grass cows, sheep, and things like that. So, and the place you would check would be the anus, the udder, and uh, the tongue, of course. Wow. Wow. And here's, well, and exa that's exactly everything that's always missing from all these animals. Well, they, uh, one other illustration from an alien point of view, in my, in my view, is a case that uh, happened with a friend of mine. It was on TV, uh, Bill Burns. He asked me if I would come on and to the show, and I said, uh, not, not unless I come on as the alien hunter. He said, well, we can't do that. And I said, then I won't be on there. <clears throat> and he said, oh, okay. So anyway, long story short, they had a young guy. There was a, a, a farm, a rancher. He had a number of his cattle uh, mutilated, and this was another one. And he said, he was in tears crying. He said, we're, we're, going to lose our ranch because an insurance company is not going to pay off on his cattle anymore. And uh, he was horrified. And the young man was standing out there in the cold with him. And, uh, and the rancher finally went back in the house and the young guy was standing there. And the young guy did something that I can't, I can't believe people can't figure this stuff out. He pulls out a metal detector, just playing around because Bill and the others are at the airport. They're just arriving, and all of a sudden he plays with a metal detector, and all of a sudden he hears this beep, 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 and it's in the cow. Oh. And whatever it is, it's moving. What? And then he gets a phone call. They said, "Come pick us up at the airport." And he said, "Well, uh, well, I, I oh, well, uh, yes, sir." And so he leaves the cow, biggest mistake he ever made. Left the cow, <clears throat> and then. Um, picks up the crew, the film crew and all that. They'll show up out there. And he said, listen to this. He pulls out the the, the uh, <clears throat> recorder again and plays it. And, and there's no sound. It's gone. Yeah. 
if he had stayed there, he would he would have not lost the object that was inside the cow. Yes, and this is something that people don't. And you mentioned that people don't realize that these cattle sometimes are worth hundreds of dollars as far as to these ranchers. You know, when they start losing these animals, I'm sure that, yeah, there's there's times that they use them, they do lose them to predators, like in nature. But <clears throat> from what I understand, this can, this can really, you know, hurt a rancher if he keeps on losing cattle that way. Yeah, whatever you've got to... Like say five or six, or in some case, we've we've had some cases which 30, 40 head of cattle or horses were or sheep were mutilated, and uh, there's no uh, no consistency with it being predation, with no consistency with it being uh, evil people cutting up cattle like satan satanists and so on. Right. Uh, so far, no no satanist uh, or anyone like that has ever been caught around or mutilated anything. And ever convict, tried or convicted of anything, uh, that that's a that's an old story. It just doesn't wash. Usually, a story that the FBI or somebody will use because they don't have a clue either. You said something earlier, which was human meat dropping out of the sky in the eighteen eighties or late eighteen hundreds. What is that? I'd never heard of that. Well, that's a it's 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 what some people might refer to as a cattle mutilation. In, 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 in large, <laughs> I mean, literally tons of meat fell out of the sky. Nobody could figure out where it came from. So some one person says, well, there could have been war. There could have been a, you know, cannon fire or something. Like that. Cannon fire did what? Hit a, a cattle factory and blew up all the workers and, uh, and all the cattle. Well, there were no explosions from anywhere whatsoever. It just fell out of a clear sky on a clear day. Nobody knew where from or what or anything about it. The only reasonable explanation would be answers from today, which might be a cattle mutilation or an animal mutilation. But there is one other uh, case uh, when you get a chance, I'll tell you about that. That's a case I handled uh, about a year and a half ago. It's okay. the most interesting mutilation case we've ever had ever in the history of mutilations. Go ahead, please. Well, in this particular case, uh, the uh, my friend of mine called me and says, "Oh my God, this is my my favorite horse, you know, the big one." And I said, "Oh yeah, I remember your horse." And uh, she said, well, "It's about fifteen and a half, but it's very very huge huge horse." Said uh, we just found we found our my horse mutilated. And I said, "Okay, well tell me all about it." And she's crying and everything. I said, "Go ahead and finish crying and tell me what happened." So, well, I came out and found my my horse laying there, and none of the other horses were near it, which is really weird because it's kind of like the mom of all the horses. It, it it's in charge. It's laying there alone beside a fence, and it and they're, they're, the ground is not tore up. In other words, when a horse gets injured, first thing you do is start kicking, trying to get up and everything else. There's not any disturbed ground where there's any kicking whatsoever. Nothing. The most amazing thing about the horse mutilation case, in this case, are you ready for this? Let's hear it. This is big. It came back alive. What? It's the only, case, only mutilation case we've ever had that came back alive. <laughs> so she called the veterinarian and everybody else and... Uh, and then, uh, because what the vet had already been out there and said your horse. Well, the, the vet she called the vet and everything, and uh, she had the vet call the vet because the entire back of the back back end of the horse had been literally uh, was missing, but the, just, something had just cored out that whole area as big as a basketball. So was, the horse was bleeding to death, and she didn't want it in pain anymore. But it still wasn't kicking or fighting or anything, which it right. should have been. Okay. And uh, it was brought back alive and uh, laying there. And the, the most amazing thing about it is, it, it, like I said, it still wasn't struggling. Uh -huh. And it recognized her and everything. And uh, she cried as they euthanized it and put it to sleep. And I said, then what happened? She's, well, we buried it. And I said, well, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. I said, this didn't happen today, tonight? No. When did it happen? Oh, this happened a couple of weeks ago. You're telling me two weeks later and you want me to investigate a horse that's been buried. Uh, I know, that's like, 
I said, you, 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 you make me really angry. I said, I said, you're a typical abductee. And by that, I mean, one of the, one of the things that abductees are installed with a program mm -hmm. that is to destroy, ignore, or hide evidence. I had never heard of that, Daryl. And you, and, and so most people haven't. I've never heard of that. I call them apps. And these are just little apps that are downloaded into abductees and contactees. They don't even know they have them. They just call you two or three weeks or a month or two or three months later and tell you about this amazing thing that happened. Just right. In other words, when like exactly when the chances are of coming to discover something, it's like, yeah, let's make sure nobody that. <laughs> well, like I told her, see, I'm your best friend. You called uh -huh. a veterinarian yes. that you had really no knowledge of. You called the state. You called uh, people of the bulldozer to come bury the cow, uh, bury the horse and all that. And you didn't even call me. I said, the, the, does that just ring a bell that there's something wrong with this picture? Yes. Yeah, like what, why, what, why did, why did you wait two weeks? What, what went off in your head that you said, well, now that two weeks have gone by. I'm well, they, they actually don't know. Uh, and of course I had worked with thousands of abductees and I know exactly what's going on with them. And, uh, and uh, like I told her, I said, you're instructed to ignore, hide, or destroy your own evidence. And you, you did a good job. Thanks for calling me two weeks late. What, I've also heard that um, the carcasses of these animals, other predators, everybody stays away from it. Like predator, yeah, I mean, they, they leave it there and it rots. No, no animal comes to eat from it. Why do you yeah, think that is? In, in, in most of the cases, that is true. In the cases where the uh, where it is strictly a military or intelligence operation, that may not be the case. But in the case with the alien, that seems to be the case. That seems to be the real marker that you can kind of look at it and say this may be alien related, because uh, predation will not occur from coyotes. And coyotes will eat anything. Mm -hmm. uh, wolves, coyotes. Uh, I mean, it, it's absolutely amazing. It, it just but nothing touches them. Right. And that's one of the things that I'm thinking. There's something here besides, you know, whether you say it was a human agency or alien, like what is it that these animals sense about this carcass that they, everything stays away from it. Nobody takes a nibble or they just, they even like leave, they, they don't leave it alone. And there's, I mean, there's gotta be something there that even if maybe they to take a tissue sample, either we don't know what we're testing for or something, or is it something around? I don't know. There's something well, there that. In the in the cases that are where I've advised people to, uh, and there, in a case, it, it, I'll give you a good example. <clears throat> there was a friend of mine called me and said that this was again back in the '90s, and he said oh, I've been invited on a special case of uh, of uh, something that's really incredible. And he, I said, he said, I'm not supposed to tell anybody. I said, Well, you can tell me. I won't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. And he says, Okay. And he says. Uh, uh, 12 workers, uh, government workers, were working on a, 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 on government land, cutting grass, whatever they were doing. And they noticed down in the valley, there was a, a bunch of elk down there. And a UFO, a small UFO, actually fairly small disc, came over and followed the elk herd and, and uh, pursued them to finally one of the elk, the younger elk, uh, ran away from the crowd. It separated them from the, from the, and the, the, uh, the UFO at that point with some unseen force picked up the small elk and took off with it. And interestingly enough, the, an elk was found that an elk of that size was found, uh, the next day mutilated. So they think that might be the case and so on. And they were going, I said, well, I, I said, I, I don't mean to be critical here. I said, I, I don't want to be ugly or to be seen that way. I said, but please do the following. Take a black light out, check it for fluorescence, do these following things. And of course, they didn't. And I said, well, no wonder you guys never find anything. Let me ask you, I, I'm sure you're familiar. Was it late 60s? I want to say out in Colorado, they had that, that horse snippy. The one that yes. was, uh, yes, and you know, you know, it, it had the UFO aspect, but then other people were saying no, that it had gotten struck by lightning. <laughs> well, you know, 
Nice try. It just doesn't work. I know I the la I know the lady who has the body of Snippy, and uh, oh, really? okay. the, the, she still has a skeleton. A friend of mine. And anyway, uh, let me give you some facts about Snippy that nobody knows. Okay. Uh, I was on TV. Uh, uh, there were seven of us who were four, only four of us were going to be chosen, and seven of us were there as the producers, and directors were trying to figure out which of these four people will we choose to be on our TV program. And uh, anyway, they put Snippy the horse up on the screen. And of course, these people are barking and going on 90 miles an hour, uh, telling, seeing who can outdo each other. And, and finally, the producer in the back who knew me uh, said, Daryl, you can jump in here at any time. And I said, well, I didn't want to get in anybody's way. And uh, <laughs> Okay. Which is kind of funny because Animal Planet had already told me they weren't even going to do the show if I didn't volunteer for the, the program. So I already knew I had a slot in it. So anyway, I said, um, well, I said, you've all told everything you probably have ever read about Snippy. And so there's not much more to tell. I think you've done a pretty good job, except the fact you didn't tell the important stuff. Everybody, the one guy who's kind of a know-it-all, Sean David Morton is who it was. Well, I know all about that. I've studied this. I know everything. And I said, okay. Well, why don't you know what I know? He said, what do you mean? I said, the best investigators keep back evidence in particular cases that are really good, like Snippy, and they don't tell you the rest of the story. No, there's nothing more to tell. I've already studied every piece of information out there. And I said, well, like I said, the best investigators. And he said, what do you think you know? I said, well, I'll tell you what I actually think I know. And I said, underneath Snippy's head, there was a white powder. I never read anything about that. I said, I said, best investigators. You weren't told because you're not an investigator. Number two is that you're not involved in the mutilation program at all, so you wouldn't have a clue. I said, the fact is that that particular powder is quite interesting. He said, well, and nobody's ever reported that before. I said, not that you know of, because again, the best investigators might know something about this and you don't. So you kind of outed yourself. I said, the fact is I've got a case that I've been starting working on in Brazil with a Brazilian uh, investigator. And in that case, long story short, uh, a ranch in the middle of nowhere, the rancher went into the city and he came back several days later. It's a long drive to where he was at getting supplies and so on. And he and it had rained during that time and he found uh, three of his cattle uh, carbonized. You, you saw the movie Star Wars, how they yes. carbonized Han Solo. Yes. Imagine that. They were carbonized laying there. And and that several chickens were carbonized and it, it rained. So there were mud around and he kept yelling for his helper, his worker, you know, where are you at? Where are you at? And, and he couldn't find him. So he looked in the little house, little tiny house where the worker stayed and he couldn't get in because the door was locked. So he looked in the window and found the man. And I said, I've got a picture of him carbonized. Oh my God. I said, then I there's carbonized too. Then there's his dog sitting next to him, half carbonized, still alive. Oh. I said, my point to you is, underneath the man and the dog was this white powder. I said, they didn't find the white powder under the other animals out there because it had rained so severely that they it washed everything away. But they did find the white powder. Like I said, the white powder is... Uh, Pretty amazing stuff. And uh, when you think about it, I said, but, well, what is it? And I said, that's really none of your business. Like I said, the best investigators would know that. <laughs> you had to torture the guy, huh? <laughs> well, he, he stuck his throat out there, handed me the knife and said, you know, what are you going to do? Well, yeah, well, see, and that's the thing. When you read about that story of Snippy, it's like, this is not like so, an animal that was hit by lightning. You know, it's like, this doesn't make sense. If, was, if, if the animal's hit hit by lightning, he should have knocked a hole in it as big as a basketball. 
and I didn't see that anywhere on that on the skeleton. Right. And and I heard that there was like a strange like acetone smell around it, like a chemical. Well, and it, the same thing, animals. Sense. So no pre no predators were coming near it. You know, I was like, I don't think animals care if something's been hit by lightning. If they're yeah, they don't care at all. Again. The cows will eat anything. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it was like again, it makes you wonder. And they had uh, so you know who, who ended up with because I think that's all that's left now is just the skeleton of Snippy, right? That's correct. Yeah, it just and that wasn't as a matter of fact. I found it quite interesting that that wasn't really the horse's name. They they renamed it Snippy after the incident it to had protect its identity. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, that's not the horse's real name, you know, but. It's one of those things that sometimes you look at it and you say, I think it, come on, you got to be insulting my intelligence to make me think that this, this is an animal. Yeah, animals, of course, get hit by lightning, of course, especially if they're standing under a tree. But, you know, yeah, there's there's other things going on there that that, does, that doesn't add up. That thing, it's really funny when you mentioned um, that thing about the guy, I'm going to go back a minute to that guy with the Rosicrucian. Do you think that some of these people that think that are hoping that they would get implanted and never do what they belong to mystery schools or they're one of these that somehow or other think that how's this that um, I don't I don't want to say communication with the aliens like that they think is the end all be all but they really don't know what they're asking for kind of deal. In my opinion, they don't have a clue. Uh, Usually they're very smart. Uh, they're upper crust people. Mm -hmm. Usually got a fairly high IQ. Uh, I've met a number of Rosicrucians and people in the so-called secret societies, right. and I've been approached by them, believe it or not, which I've I'm never sure. approached them. I just it, it, one time I was I, that's not true. One time I met there was a there was a booth in a mall mm -hmm. in Houston many years ago, and uh, it was uh, the it was a worst recruit. There was three guys in it. There was this younger guy and another guy talking to another guy outside the booth. They were rattling on. And I thought, well, let's have some fun here. See what the natives are doing. So I walked up and asked the young guy, I said, so what do you guys do? What is this all about? He pulls out a brochure and starts showing me stuff. I just looked at it and tossed it back on the table. I said, that's what you tell the society at large. I said, I want to know what you really do. Oh boy! And then the guy, uh, the tall guy inside the his boss, I guess, he walks over, moves his hand, and the guy gets out of the way. He said, "May I help you, sir?" And I said, "Well, I, I hope so, but I, I don't know if you can or not." Well, I would certainly like to address your issues. And I said, "Okay." I said, "I, uh, I raise a hawk. I raise a red-tailed hawk." And I said, I talked, the first question I asked him, I said, can people teach things that they don't know? He said, well, of course not. And I said, I mean, like, you know, if, if you don't know math, do you, can you teach math? He said, well, of course not. And I said, okay. I said, well, I raised a red-tailed hawk and I taught my hawk how to fly. You don't suppose I can fly, do you? Oh, my God. <laughs> Boy, he got quiet. Then the guy outside walked over. And he came to the outside where I was at, outside the booth. He moved his hand, and the other two guys moved out of the way. And I realized, aha, this is the boss. Right. Finally, got somebody. Uh -huh. And he says, uh, I'm delighted to meet you. He said, I'm afraid, as you well know, these two don't have a clue what you're talking about. I do. And I'm glad to make your acquaintance. And I would like for you to come speak to our uh, tri-state group of the Rosicrucians, blah, 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 and so on. I said, no, I wouldn't be interested. And he said, well, but but you're, I said, one of you, like you. And <laughs> anyway, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> and then I left. And you know, it, it, it just, my wife, you know, said, what are you doing? I said, just messing with the natives. <laughs> So it was like, okay, so yeah, who was, in other words. But they, but they, but I've had different group people, people like that uh, come up and, and talk to me about, we're going to set, we're going to start a temple and, uh, 
and I'm the high priest of it or whatever. I've got a whole crew of people and we've got money and all kinds of stuff we need for you because you are the man. You are you have contact with aliens. You're doing things that nobody knows anything about. We know that. And we need you to be part of our organization. Yeah, and you can we need introduce you to them to the, nah, to the aliens. Forget it, clown. You can play Not that speaker. <laughs> That's what they're hoping for. <laughs> hey. I don't know. I have no that's, idea. That's, and you know, sometimes I think that people that think like that, it's not exactly, I don't think they know, I don't think that what they expect it's going to be is what it's going to be. I'll tell you something that uh, that happened to me that I've never told anybody. And, and uh, this, uh, the reason I, I, I'm hesitant to say it is because, uh, okay, if, when I use the word Illuminati, everybody thinks they already know what you're talking about. Right. Trust me, you don't. You just don't. And, uh, well, we know this. No, you've read a bunch of stuff about it, but you don't know. You, you don't know where they're located, where their headquarters at. Well, the Rothschilds are in charge. Ah, oh, give me a break. You don't know anything. You think you do. You read a bunch of stuff, but you don't have a clue. Any, anyway, one day, you're not even going to believe this. <laughs> I got an email. Guess from who? The Illuminati. The, one of the top leaders of the Illuminati. Oh, boy. And, of course, I didn't believe any of this i'm like you know you know this what so who's running this scam or whatever you know right and uh and there would be certain things they would do if they're running scams so on, and none of that happened in fact he was extremely gracious very articulate very well educated and uh said uh I admire your work to no end and i wanted to send you some information that might be useful to you about implants i wrote him back and after i did a lot of checking it took me a while to find out if this was even legit i mean uh -huh. this guy bared up like an alabama tick you know right. so uh anyway a long story short i wrote him back and i said uh, i said i want to tell you how much i appreciate your attempt to help me and so on i said i've read your information and where it was from i'm very familiar with it I said the information originally came from a guy named Colonel Wilson. Colonel Wilson was the leader of a big UFO group back in the 80s and 90s. No one had actually ever met him, and the people that ran his organization had never met him. I said the reason I know about him is because I met him on three occasions here in Houston, Texas. He contacted me personally and gave me the document that you just gave me. And he said he knew all about it, and he knew all about it. He was trying to help me out and everything. I said, everybody's always trying to help me get my stuff together. And I told him the same thing I'm going to tell you. I said, uh, the information is incorrect. It's inconsistent. It's bogus. And is probably put together by the intelligence community to keep lead people off the track. And this is not what implants do, nor is it, nor is it even an intelligence implant. Uh, and I went through the whole thing and I said, but I do want to thank you for your uh, honest attempt to assist me and so on and so on and so on. He sent me probably a hundred pages of all kinds of stuff if I wanted to really pursue the alien and so on and so on. And I said, uh, I said again with great respect. Uh, I said I wanted to let you know that I have read over the information and much of it I've already seen. And uh, and in that case of the implant, as an example, I said that simply just isn't the case. And it's uh, and it's not an intelligence implant information, and it what it was is a little device that fits in the back of your head, and if you start telling anything, the CIA will blow it blow it up in your back. Of your head will explode and kill you instantly. Problem is, they just hadn't had just never found any abductees with their head blown off, you know, from right. an alien implant. This I hadn't found one of those. I'm looking, you know, I'll be glad to find it, but uh, anybody I just, the back just of hadn't head. found it. So anyway, that's uh, but I did look into that organization and I was uh, amazed at the high level of uh, educated people that were involved and so on. And, uh, and out of respect for them, I kept the information private because they, it wasn't about, I don't, I don't think it was an overt attempt to recruit me. I mean, no, they didn't say, yeah, sure, sure, form, fill them out. You know, we'd love to have you join us. It wasn't like that at all. It was just, uh, somebody who admired what I was doing, but I thought it was interesting that they were watching. So the Illuminati tried to illuminate you. 
whatever that means. In my case, that might that might be like trying to plug a, a power line into a weak light bulb. Didn't work very well. And <laughs> again, yeah, and it, it well it goes to show that they were taking in despite maybe their connections or whoever their members were, they were taken in again by information that you pointed out to them, which is like this is the origins are not exactly what you think it is. Well, so they're amazing. not as infallible. Yeah, the, the amazing thing about it to me was, uh, now there may be a whole, I'm sure, a plethora of things they do we don't know anything about. And, and, and probably the legends about them are probably more valuable to them because it keeps everybody running for these red herrings everywhere. And uh, they right. can't put it together. And so these people have their own agenda. And uh, the vast amount of uh, money, the vast amount of uh educated people and others that were involved in this was staggering to me. I was absolutely uh, most impressed. And if that was their, the real agenda, then uh, I am duly impressed, but not interested in the organization. It also makes you think that a lot of these families that, you know, they're so-called Illuminati's like, you know, all these, I want to say sometimes you think of them as chew toys, that these are the names that they put out, you know, that they run all these pieces. And I think that the people that are really, really know, they know that what the, the power of anonymity is. In other words, nobody, for all you know, maybe some, you say their names and people go, who? Who's that? Because they understand. You know, contrary to what, you know, everybody now, celebrity, everybody, there's more power in anonymity than well, most people suppose. So For sure, for sure. You know, I think that sometimes people don't realize that like you said, some of these stories that go about around, they're just like, okay, either they're outdated or they were put out there for a purpose just so that, Hey, yeah, that, yeah, those, yeah, those are the people that do that. Well, Whatever. even if the information is accurate a hundred years ago or 80 yeah. years ago or 300 years ago or 300 years ago, that information might be accurate, but it's uh, outdated today. And the yes. fact is, you know, where are they? You know, well, it's the Rothschild family. They're controlling the banking system and they're doing all that. There are people that do that anyway, and they're probably not them. Right. And, and that, now let me ask you something. Do you think, because you, I'm going to go with, with uh, do you think that, because there's, I don't know, there's talk, if you want to, we'll call it talk, that ex, exposing how much, let's say we're going to go with the United States, knows about aliens or that that's really one of the biggest secrets that the government wants to keep? The, the, the issue of aliens is, is probably more secretive than the quote unquote Illuminati and all that. Right. The secret societies. And, uh, you know, uh, anyway, my, my suspicion is that it is a much, much greater guarded secret. Okay. Uh, because people tell me, well, you've got more evidence than any human being out there. I said, well, that's true with the exception of the intelligence community. They've got a lot more than I do. I said, the fact is that there's a, they've got a huge budget. And I don't. And uh, I said, you give me, you know, $2 million in a year, I'll have an alien laying on the table. That's do you think I, that they're keeping it for, you know, and I'm not, for, besides national security, which is what you always, that's the excuse for everything, you know, <laughs> national security. Besides that, do you think it's a question of just trying to keep the the technology that's been gained? Or well, is I, I, I think I, I think you're you're onto a good point, but I think uh, I'm I'm going to answer it from uh, okay. The best answer I can give you is this: I use seven hats to dis to define everything I do. Uh, okay. the, the seven hats I call are the seven hats of my. Uh, uh, how shall I say it? The seven hats of my uh, uh, my uh, Supreme Court, basically of my 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 work, and uh, by that I mean simply uh, these seven hats are the hats that I use to do, to review or to study anything. And those hats, uh, the first hat is the UFO hat. The UFO hat. Is, uh, is a hat we all wear. The problem with the UFO hat is it gets us in trouble. How many of us have been fooled or been lied to 
or been had the wool pulled over our eyes by people in the UFO community that were outright liars, hoaxers, and so on. Well, a lot of us have, and we, we believed in this this a guy and his account found out is one hundred percent fake. Believing that guy back in the fifties, his story is fake, and so you know your people get a little dubious about how to deal with that and everything. So those seven hats, the second, the, so I get rid of my UFO hat right off the bat because that one can be fooled real easy, and it believes into every it believes into just about every conspiracy you come up with. It kind of makes sense. The second hat is my cop hat. That one doesn't believe anything. When it goes after you, it's coming after the information and the facts and not your opinion, because that doesn't mean anything, just the data. Then there's a medical hat, like we do an implant uh, surgery. The medical hat's going to be the one to take charge of that. Then the science hat will come in afterward, and we do the science on it. But of all these seven hats, of all seven of them, each of those hats comes into play when you ask me a question. And I have to go through those seven hats and decide which answer do you really need? Because if, if for instance, if you, not necessarily you, but if the, your audience is wearing a UFO hat, they want a UFO answer. Right. And if you give them an intelligence answer from your intelligence hat, they're not going to like that at all. So that's not what I want to hear. Right. So that's just the way it is. So it depends on where a person is at. So I have to evaluate where they're at and what best, answer do they really need where what's going to help them get along life way here a little better right so uh, my answer from a uh, of that question uh, is would have to be from every one of those hats uh, from the ufo hat it, it just gets the answers just get wacky uh, from the cop hat is there is uh, some evidence but a lot of it's ob ob obscured because uh, the witnesses disappear or the information disappears. There's no way to verify and so on. But each one of these hats in themselves is not the answer. These are just answers. So when you get to the intelligence hat, the intelligence hat doesn't care about you, period. It never has. The intelligence hat, I don't care if it's KGB, I don't care if it's Mossad, I don't care if it's CIA, it makes no difference. Their answer is always about protecting their turf, their answer, their information, and using the United States government to cover it as best they can. Uh, the fact is, if they knew, if they knew it with these are aliens here coming to save the earth, fix the ozone hole and all that, you're never going to find that out. If they <laughs> find out, that, right? it doesn't matter. If they find out they're here to barbecue us, eat us, and boil us, and whatever, they're never going to tell you that either, because they have, they want to manage that. They think they have enough knowledge to take care of that. What they don't realize is the cumulative amount of information from abductees, if extracted correctly by someone like me, will give you far better information about that phenomenon than you can imagine. And I'll give you a case in point. Uh, a man came to me uh, some time ago, years ago, and he said, I used to... Uh, build stuff for the intelligence community. He, he said the military. And I laughed and I said, what'd you build? And he, so he told me, I said, did you furnish the medals or did they? And he said, they did. And I said, when you built it, what kind of corners did it have? He said, it didn't have any corners. I said, do you have any idea what you were doing? He said, no. But they had very specific, very specific qualifications for what we were to do. And I said, okay. I said, you're building something for a, it's part of a craft. He got real quiet. What makes you think that? That's because I've been in them. I already know what, I know what it is you're working on. He got real quiet again. And I said, uh, the fact is, um, I said this, th what you've described, the process you've described, I said, this is consistent with what would be there. And he anyway, he was uh, floored by the whole thing. And I said, <clears throat> but from an intelligence answer, that's it. From a science answer, well, they're just trying to assist in some way to do this. No, they're interested. The intelligence answer is what can I do to make that 
support me and our, my views and all, all of my intelligence operations and keep it hid from the world and I can still use it and still get ahead of everybody and be in charge. How do we do that? Because they're never going to, you're not in the equation at all. Right, exactly. It's like, it's right. We're inconsequential as far as, of course, not to ourselves because we're the center of each of our universes, but from their perspective, it's humanity as in a collective, like, okay, we're going to do what we're going to need to do. And you know how they say collateral damage, if it has to, well, that, so be it, if that's what it takes. And honestly, when you describe the thing with the seven hats, I think, at least for myself, I would want to know just the truth. You know, is it, are you protecting technology? I'm not saying by this that if there hasn't been any alien, you know, contact, but is all of this just to protect technology? Um, well, a good portion of it is. Uh, another good portion of it is the fact that, uh, it, okay, in, in, in World War II, something really, really remarkable happened on one of the islands in the Pacific. An airplane crashed mm -hmm. and the pilot died. And it was just a single a fixed wing aircraft. That's all. It's just real simple aircraft, like a spotter plane. And uh, the natives on the island, when the islands have finally gotten, you know, after the war, you know, the military is going around doing things and they showed up and these islanders were like amazed. And they said, yeah, you know, and they like were, you know, they said, we want to show you something. And they took them over to this aircraft that, of course, had, totally dilapidated and wrecked. It was a, something that came down from the sky. They'd never seen an airplane before. Okay. So they made a, a, made a statue basically out of it, something to worship, so to speak. Those that came down from the sky about like UFO people today, really. What's the difference? Right. For us, we, you're, you're still a bunch of natives jumping around this thing like right. the intelligence community. They don't know how to fix it. They don't know how to fly it. They don't even know what gas is. And you, yes. what are they going to do with that thing? What are you going to do with it? Right. Exactly. So you interpret it based on what you know. or I mean, You just do whatever you can, pick some of the parts, hope you can understand it, and hope that uh, not too many of your people get uh, die from a result of handling things you shouldn't have never handled. Let me tell you something. That's another thing I always think about, you know, because when I look at the, you know, you always hear that, yes, we've had contact with them and advances we've had in technology is based off of materials that we've gotten from some. And I'm thinking to myself, considering that it sounds like they're more advanced than us technology wise, you have to be really careful. What if you're trying to back engineer something and it blows up? I mean, that's sometimes I'm thinking. How much can you well, back engineer something that you didn't create at all or really might not even have any idea how it works or maybe even made of materials that are not part of the earth? I mean, to me, it sounds kind of dangerous. Well, Unless there was impossible, a, but dangerous. There was a case that happened uh, many years ago uh, uh, and it happened in Mexico right across the border from Texas. And the, the intelligence community called the Mexican government, the federales, and said, uh, you've got a UFO that uh, crashed near here. And they told them where it was at, said, would you like for us to handle it? And they said, no, we will do it. We know we can do it. We can do everything. Right. Well, the Mexicans sent their federales and scientists and whatever out there. And uh, within a few hours after all of that, the intelligence community called back and said, told their, their, uh, the government people said, all of your people are laying out there dead on the ground. Would you like for us to handle it? They said, of course. So that's how we got that UFO. Okay. There you go. There, you there are go. certain things you should not tamper with in UFOs. Yes. I, I, that I believe it, I, you know, it might be, just because it's totally, all right, foreign, uh, maybe there is like, uh, it does have some type of self-defense system, mechanical, doesn't even have to be intentional, it could be mechanical. Well, that's that's a distinct possibility that all that has to be considered, and I'm sure 
we've already learned a great deal about that already just from people that have gotten exposed but the fact is that there was a remarkable statement that was made on tv the other night and i was very glad to hear it because i realized this guy's got his oars in the water and it was a scientist that was at stanford uh, and uh, Ger dr gary nolan's who it was and you can google him and find this out to be true on uh, google because he uh, and the, the problem was this he went forward and uh when he finds out stuff, he just goes out on TV and tells it. He said, because this belongs to humanity. It doesn't belong. He's, he believes like I do. Uh, some things are should be secretive and so on. If it involves that sort of thing, yes. But things that involve humanity and everything else, we all need to know about it. Of course. And so he said, uh, <clears throat> he's talking to this, this uh, reviewer, and the reviewer should have kept his mouth shut and just listened. This guy has forgotten more information than you're ever going to know. And he said, the CIA brings me cases all the time. <clears throat> and he said, what do you mean? <clears throat> he said, cases where pilots or people on these nuclear aircraft carriers where the UFOs are coming down and doing things and all these amazing film footage you see on TV. He said, a lot of those people are getting lesions on their brain and about 100 of them have died so far. Oh, wow. There you go. And he said, the intelligence community is never going to tell you this, but I will, because I think if you're flying a, uh, your jet up there next to a UFO, you might want to know about that. I mean, how, how many lesions can you take on your brain before you no longer function well and can't fly or even die? And about 100 of them have already. That's a lot. He said, so everybody keeps talking, well, there's no danger. The aliens are, everybody's happy with that. Really? Well, why aren't so many of our pilots dying? Right. And who knows? Maybe by the time the lesions show up, there's no connection or they don't want to make the connection as in that experience well, with the, the problem with the lesions is that they, they said the reason they bring these people or their cases to me, especially their MRIs, is that I'm the top person in the world to ask that question as to how it. He said, I could give you a hint. He said, these lesions are due to an un unknown energy source that these people came into contact with or came too close to. And he said, as a result, many of them uh, end up with these lesions in their brain and it affects them, of course. And then uh, about 100 of them have died as a result. He said, their cases are in court now. And what the, the relatives are wanting me to do is testify in court against the CIA or whoever is responsible for this stuff that, you know, our relative died chasing UFOs at your direction, so to speak. Right. And uh, he said, so that's what I testify to. Exactly. That's very interesting. Because I've always thought of that as in there's got to be some level of danger when you're basically experimenting with technology that you have no idea what what's in it or what's capable of or, you know, you know, you just cut something the wrong way, and next thing you know, it. Yeah, you know, we, we really don't know. So, and then there's. Let me ask you: Do you think there's any truth to that theory? Because I want to call it a theory that, uh, as far as uh, that they want us or their interest in us is for our genetic material, as for as far as producing hybrids, or because their genetic material is not any good, or, or what do you think about that? Well, after studying this for over 50 years, I basically uh, looked at it with the seven different hats, and those type of stories don't make sense. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, great, it's, it's great science fiction stuff, makes great movies, but there's no evidence of that. The, uh, the question is, have they or have they attempted to make hybrids or something like that in some form or another? Well, of course, that's true. Uh, we, we have evidence of that. But the, the big question is, are they going to take over the planet? Or are they trying to do this, fix their DNA? They came back in time and they did this. Well, uh, if they came back in time to fix the problem, why didn't they fix it 10,000 years ago? Right. Why are they late? Why are they so smart they're stupid that they got here late? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, so, uh, like I said, when you put the other hats on, see, the problem with, with all, all my hats have to come up with a consensus. When those hats don't come up with a consensus, 
there's something wrong with the story. Right. So that's what that's it, 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 the UFO hat loves those type of stories. Loves them. I mean, oh my God, they're coming from another time, another dimension. They're doing this. They told me so. So I believe every word the alien tells me. You know, yeah, that's well, a that's a UFO hat. That's what it does. Right. Well, I'll, you know what? I'll I'll throw you one of my theories, and some this is because, of course, this this is for your UFO hat. What if these we'll call them extraterrestrials are stuck here? I don't know how they traveled what we were talking interdimensional you know light years whatever they're stuck here whatever happens and we don't know they can't go back and they can't go to where they really wanted to so they're stuck here on earth which is not really the best place for them and they've been around here for a long time and maybe what they have you know they had a finite amount of members of what they originally were okay and without knowing what their lifespan is they're forced to hybridize with us because otherwise you know eventually you run out of your your members okay either they age out or you can't keep you know if we go with interbreeding you know you you develop a bunch of problems so in a way they were forced to hybridize with us which maybe took a lot of how what, what do you call it um trial and error and sometimes i think what if they're stuck here what if they're earthlings like us at this point is what i'm saying I'm not talking about that they got stuck here 20 years ago or 1947 in Roswell. I'm talking way back. And um, they just haven't gone anywhere because everybody thinks, okay, how long are they going to be around? Maybe they just, at, at some point, they decided we're just going to stick around and make the best of it. But if in, and I would say, let's say we're looking at the planet Earth. Obviously, this, I'm talking as an original Earthling kind of deal. Okay, I'm acclimated. This is my natural habitat. So not only is it because you have a finite amount, but if it as a life form, it's easier for you to live in this in in the earth if you're hybridized. If you've taken over some of the genetics, it makes it easier for you to live here. That's just my theory. So there's that one for your UFO hat. <laughs> well, it's a, it is one we've considered. Uh, it, it looked at I've looked at stuff like this, like I said, for over fifty years. And uh, again, when you start using the different hats, they 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 they, they come after that and, and views and, and, and look at them very seriously. Uh, one of the difficulties with that is the fact that we've got great video film of these uh, some of the craft hundreds of miles, one of them fifty miles thick, six hundred miles uh, thick, mm -hmm. fifty miles thick, six hundred miles across. We got it on film. Not filmed by us, but by filmed by independent film producer, okay. and out of Japan, and uh, so it's already in outer space. And there's been many sightings on the moon and other planets, and so on, and uh, UFOs underground, uh, in the underwater. I mean, right? It, it, that that make any sense to me? It's it's not like you know we forgot where we parked the car. You know the cars are out there. They're <laughs> They're, they're flying around. <laughs> they're chasing our aircraft and, and they're kicking our butts, so to speak. And, you know, because, you know, I'm sure you've heard, go. Oh, there's more than one type of extraterrestrial that's around. Some of them have left and some of them have come back. And Of course. And, you know, and I'm hearing, okay, well, you know, maybe they do have this technology, but yeah, they can, how can this, how can I say, maybe the best they could do is not too far away from the earth. Maybe the moon, maybe, maybe only solar system wise not not as far as what we're thinking as far as we're talking here like you know the other part of the galaxy or another galaxy or another part of the universe or if you want to go with the inter interdimensionals whatever maybe for some reason they they can travel and i had also heard what was it that they had captured some of these spaceships at the only what was it oh, god i can't remember what country was that they had these cameras basically aimed what was it trying to capture some type of sun activity and that they basically realized that they would seen these crafts by the shadows they were casting but they were darting so quickly that in other words they really weren't looking to capture spaceships but they were huge exactly like the dimensions that you were describing and the only reason they got it was because of the somehow or other the shadow that they cast and like i said these cameras were set there you know for lengths of time and finally they started studying them and that's how they realized that these things are 
darting across back and forth, very high speeds, and they're huge. I don't know if you had heard of that, which was well, like, wow. One lady uh, uh, confronted me at a conference one time and said, Mr. Sims, you're just negative. You just don't understand. I said, I've heard that before. So why don't you enlighten me? She said, they're far advanced than us. They're advanced civilizations or that. And I said, sweetie, have you ever met an alien? No. I said, well, I have. You know what the little gray's IQ is? She said, what? I said, about 80. You know what 80 is on an IQ scale on Earth? It's a moron. <laughs> Now, if he's an advanced civilization from Zeta Reticuli or wherever you think he's from, why is it he can't get his oars in the water? I said, then the, the little alien that's the no, another taller alien that's bigger than he is, often referred to as the doctor, he's got an IQ of about 135 or 140. He's a lot smarter. If there's going to be an implantation or some surgical like or mutilation work going on, he's the one that's going to do it. I said, but the little guys are made, hatched, cloned, and manufactured for the purpose of making you think they're from other planets. I said, isn't that interesting? Well, they're, they made crap, and they're, you're wrong because they made their spaker. I said, sweetie, many of these aliens only have three fingers without an opposing thumb. You don't have an opposing thumb. How do you make things? Exactly. How do you do that? She's, oh, well. I never thought of that. And I said, there's probably a couple other things you haven't thought about as well. If you've got an IQ of 80 and three fingers, what do you think you're going to make? And I said, you're not going to make anything. The fact is, what you don't understand is somebody made it for him. Okay. And you're, you're missing the whole thing. I said, well, they're doing this. And I said, well, before you enlighten the universe with your knowledge and fill this room with your wisdom as you might want to think very carefully about what you're saying i said the fact is that i said you don't even know the history as you realize these the, the abduction phenomena is only no more no and i'm exaggerating here no more than 200 years old so if it's only 200 years old and probably less than that well uh, what was going on before that? I said, there were other programs that you don't know anything about. And I said, the UFO people are with their UFO hats are so caught up in the alien phenomena. They don't even know what the rest of the show's about. They have no clue. Right. And I said, let me give you one last piece of information that might help you. Uh, and, and she said, okay. And I said, I said, I, I said, I can show you film footage if I wanted to right now of a craft. 600 miles across, 50 miles thick. Do you have any idea how big that is? She says, what do you mean? I said, if you had something that big, what would you need a planet for? Exactly. You could move that around anywhere you wanted with anything on it. And I said, I won't go into the details of what we found on the ship. I'll just leave it with you and we'll just act like they created everything because they're so smart. Exactly. And you think about something 600, it's like, what, depending on what state you're in, it could cover maybe half of your state of just about. That's fact. And 50 you know, miles thick, how many, how many layers, how many rooms could be in there? Sure. Wow. Exactly. And that's just one. I can, I can show you another craft over 1,200 miles long. The question is, where, where are they at? You know, Drake's equation says, uh, well, based on the idea of evolution and everything else, the Big Bang and so on, they should be, they should be uh, millions of light years. They should be everywhere. And for many, he comes, come, comes along with his thinking and says, that's probably true. The question is, where are they? We hadn't found anybody yet. Uh -huh. So if they're everywhere, and they should be, according to Fermini's equation, his information, they should be located right out, like a, right outside Houston. They ought to be a moon base out there. They're not anywhere. We hadn't found a moon base anywhere. Where are right. they? Exactly. And that's, what was it? Why that's are they hiding? 
Especially if they've got a craft that's 600 miles across. Well, you can do anything you want. you got all kinds of technology. What? There's something out there bigger than this whole thing running the thing, and it's right. the aliens not in charge. Everybody wants to think they are because that you're like the like the, to me the native that saw the airplane crash mm -hmm. and the man in it and he died so they buried him and then they decorated the uh, airplane and kept it in tatters and rags and everything and the troops showed up and they looked at it it's like what in the world are you, are you guys doing with that that's that's an airplane no that's something special from the skies we saw it come down and the the one who came from the skies with it the one from the stars came down and there he is. Yeah, we buried him. They deify it. They deify it. That's one of our pilots. You know? No, you don't understand. You weren't here. You don't know anything about these things. Yes. We know all about it. They deify it. They do. They did. You know, people don't realize that the unknown to, to, um, to a civilization that has never seen something, they... They're scared of it, but they, they make it sometimes more than what it is. How's that? Well, you make it whatever you can. Uh, you, how do we say it in some some theory, some uh, psychological fields? You work with the resources that you have. And if you don't have any, you make them up. You generalize, delete, and distort information. And you just improvise and do what you can with what you got. And make a statue out of it or something tell everybody the pilot came down from the skies and he's far advanced than us because we're still chucking spears and he's got a he's got a, a, a single craft single winged uh aircraft that you you deified so do you think at some point that the extraterrestrials are gonna make their presence known regardless of what world governments want and say oh be quiet forget it we're gonna we're gonna let them know we're here you think that's ever going to happen? No, I don't. The, the idea of disclosure is a joke. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I was uh, okay. I was at a big conference um, uh, in Washington State. Nick Pope was there with me, and we were the two top speakers. And they they brought in this lady who was really sharp. I mean, she was well read, well versed in the the UFO phenomena and in intelligence questions. And she asked. Nick, the first question, she said, do you think disclosure is going to happen and all that? And he said, absolutely. And he gave her all these accolades of how it's going to happen and so on. And she said, Mr. Sims, question to you. Do you think disclosure is going to happen? I said, no. And she said, well, you were both sharply disagreed. And I said, well, I said, uh, I said, I said uh, this is going to sound personal, but it isn't. I said, my background is in the intelligence community. I said, I've worked in the Central Intelligence Agency for two years, covert operations, and so on, and so on. I've worked at the spy training camp for uh, training uh, case officers, spies. And I learned quite a bit about the tradecraft for myself. And I said, I don't know what Nick actually did back in the MOD. But in my opinion, it, it wasn't very important because he still doesn't know the answer oh to that. God, did you do? I said, Her I turn. know, I know what I did for a living, right. I, I, but I, I actually do know what he did, and I could prove it, but I didn't want to. I wasn't there to trash him. I, he, I, I told him, I looked at him, and said, I said, Nick, I told you in 1994, don't do this. If you want to pull out the big guns, that's fine. But you're going to pay the price, and I said, and I did. I made him pay, and I said, uh, the fact is that you don't know. And uh, I said, and you you quote you, you see something on the news, and you say, well, that's it. That's that's disclosure proof that we're. And I said, Nick. I said we have been waiting in the intelligence community for seventy years for you guys to show up with a big congressional investigation. We're going to make you tell us everything. I said, did you like the first story we told you? I said, that one, somebody accidentally, stupidly let the cat out of the bag and said, we found a flying saucer at Roswell. The next day, we changed it to, no, it was a, uh, it was a weather balloon. Mm -hmm. Then later, it was Project Mogul. Then later, we changed it to another story. I said, we got four different stories out there for you. How, which one of those did you like best? 
as when you bring your as we've been waiting for 70 years for you guys to show up with the congressional investigation you have never shown up you've never done anything you're not scaring anybody and uh, i said i promise you the next when you come with your big congressional investigation and warn us about the big one you're going to really get us if we don't tell you the big one i said i promise you We've got an answer so good, you're going to love it. It's not the truth. Truth is just a lie. It hadn't been told yet. Right. Uh, these are cover stories, uh, Nick. And I said, and obviously you don't know that. So let me, do you ever think that they're going to use the threat of alien invasion for... Well, the intelligence community could use something like that. And, I mean, uh, it, I mean, it, uh, it, it's uh, possible. I mean, we've we've seen enough alien invasion movies for the, what the last forty years or fifty years, till it's like, oh my god, there it is, you know, to to basically make everybody do what they want. Do you think that's ever possible? Sure, the, the intelligence committees, governments would do that. The Chinese would do it in a heartbeat if they if they had the tech to do it. Well, let me give you one quick example for your audience, and this is a true story. Uh, in the days of JFK, just before he was assassinated. Uh, the Central Intelligence Agency wanted to uh, take Cuba for the U.S. And, uh, I mean, for all practical purposes, we owned it anyway because the mafia was down there with their casinos. Yes. So, you know, no big deal. Then the, then here come the uh, the uh, rebels and uh, Castro and his boys, and they started taking over. We had a bunch of our CIA people down there going to fight it out with them and, and so on, and Kennedy wouldn't give the go-ahead to... Uh, to do it. He didn't want, he didn't want it have to happen. And anyway, one of the things the uh, CIA told Kennedy was we could cause a large hologram in the sky. Okay. And these were Roman Catholic people. We can make it look like the Virgin Mary. Like it, like anybody knows who the Virgin Mary looks like. And he said, they're all, they would think that in fact, it was God doing that. And they would give up without a fight. Right. And he said, no, of course, the, the personal part of that where he didn't like it, he's Roman Catholic himself. He didn't like the idea to begin with. And, uh, and but that's the intelligence community. They have their own ideas and ways of doing things. And but we had the technology back then to do that. And that was what, 70 years ago? No, well, yes. 50 sure. years ago was a lot. 50 years ago, easy. Yeah. And let me tell you something. I'm going to get off on a tangent. I'm Cuban-American. I was born in the United States, but my whole family's Cuban. I've never understood, looking at it, that I, ne I never understood why the U.S. allowed a country that was, like you said, every, you know, you had the casinos, you had a bunch of American companies there. Um, I remember my mother would tell me, oh, we would see the, like, you know, every new, the new cars coming out. They would first be in Cuba before you ever saw them in the U.S. And I always thought, how did the U.S. allow an island that's 90 miles off the coast to be taken over? I could never figure it out. Like Kennedy, now we're this Kennedy did not want to get in another war. He was trying to shut down the Vietnam War, and he wanted to make sure we didn't get in a war 90 miles off our coast. And so he wouldn't send the 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 cover the uh, military cover for the CIA operatives that were already on the ground. And as a result, hundreds of our uh, case officers, agents, as you would call them, CIA people, got caught by the by them, and were, some of them were executed or tortured, and yes. others were put in prisons, and so on and so on. And I I have friends that were involved in the the Bay of Pigs uh, fight, so I know what I'm talking about. And uh, anyway, the the CIA's hated uh, him ever since. They they did. Well, you have to understand, and this is the thing. Yeah, basically everybody sees, you know, when he did the uh, coup d'etat, you know, what against Batista and whatever. But there was that was there was years behind that in preparation to get to that point. It's the, the part that I'm always thinking. You're telling me nobody could go in there like they do, like they do now, infiltrate and disrupt it. You know, they already had that taken care of. The CIA was ready to go. All they had to get from President. Uh, uh, John F. Kennedy was the go-ahead because they had the aircraft waiting right. Uh, we already had, everything was ready to take over the island, all of it. 
and he would not give the go ahead. And as a result, when the rebels came in in great force, uh, they caught our guys literally out in the water, forced them out in the water, literally caught them. Well, look at now what we're, the problem we're having with China. Well, it's horrible. It's it, I, it's a, a, <laughs> it's a like huge, mis huge mistake. And all those people have been enslaved in communism ever since. Yes, yes, it's very I right. hate it. The reason why I, I hate say this, my grandfather was a police officer. This was in the late 50s. By the time this happened, he had already retired. And he, you know, this was the time of what they call the beat cops, you know, where you had your area and you had a part of Havana and, but towards the end of his um, of his career, he was playing close with a partner. And he says, I knew everybody. I knew who was the thief, who was the petty thief, who was, I knew everybody who did everything. That's right. And he says, this was right before he retired, he said they started to have bombs going off. And he says that they would do it like, he says like one time he got there and they had put it under, you know, these houses where the porches like basically are on the sidewalk, like. Mm -hmm. And he says they placed the bomb under our house. They, the lady, she, her legs got blown off, and he was the first one to get there. And he said at the beginning he was trying to figure out, like, who's doing, you know, like, these are just people living in a house. Who's going to place a bomb? You know, in other words, they, they ruled out there was nothing like a natural, you know, like a gas leak or anything else that could have made right. it. Right. This is called terrorism. Said, terrorism, exactly. And this is, he says he realized what was going on and he was close and he kind of told some of the family members, like, we need to get out. I'm, go I'm going to Miami to retire. He, he good idea. He saw this. He saw good this, idea. But he realized what was happening. My point being that this was something that was a process, that, that terrorism, where you do that to your, to the people that are living there. And um, it keeps so, them under control. Yes, it you does. You need them it afraid does. and, you need them to make you think that the government's there to protect them. Exactly. The way to do that is to create your own terrorism. And that's exact. And what was unfortunately, <clears throat> it's really funny because the communists or well, they didn't say they were communists back then. Remember, Fidel never said he was communist till later on. He hmm. was basically ba blaming the ba the Batista government on those things. And it was the other way around. And but whatever. Sure. It's another t another time in history, but. The reason why I bought it out is that you mentioned about China, and now we've got China supposedly wanting to, and we've got them like 90 miles off the coast of the U.S., and it's like, man. That's in, it's completely insane. It's like, oh. And, and I've also heard that, and I don't know if, if or if, that they do have the capabilities of holograms that are very convincing now, yes. you know, as far as the technology uh, of making people think they're seeing something that's not really there that will be like sure. huh? you know if we go well, the chinese have got uh, remarkable nation. technology and uh, yeah. and the fact is the the chinese uh, biden's uh state his uh state department guy just came back from china begging them to uh please talk to us and the only way they talked to him they said tell us that that uh, taiwan is uh, part of china and he, he agreed he said taiwan Taiwan is is part of China. That's he gave him the go ahead to attack to take it over. That's, I'm that's not even believing this stuff. I know, and you, you see some of those things, and I guess you know I've only been alive X amount of years. <laughs> that did you realize, like, man, this is not right. good. This is not good, and uh, you know, and, and and there's even people, uh, you know, that, that haven't been alive for the you know when we had that the the missile crisis, and sure. I remember I used to work with a girl. And she says, oh, my parents, they really thought something was happening. They shipped us off to relatives. We were little kids, shipped, the, shipped us off to another state with some relatives because they really thought that, you know, that it was that that uh, they were going to get hit, you know, with missiles. And people don't realize, you know, you haven't been alive that long, what it's like That's to right. live with that hanging over your head as a reality, as a possible reality. How's that? So, yeah, sometimes getting back to the UFO alien thing, you know how much of it also can be uh, manipulated for other purposes. It can and and will be, in my opinion, it, whenever they need it. Yeah, and that's a that's a scary thought because there's a lot of people that will buy into it. Hook, sure line, and sinker. Hook, line, and sinker is like, I knew it. They're here. You know, Independence Day or one of those one of those War of the World kind of deals. That's true. That's what it is. Daryl, it has been absolutely wonderful to speak to you. If uh, just for my podcast listeners, what is your website address if they wanted to go ahead and, and contact? My you? website address is uh, a, a, thealienhunter.com. Okay. 
And if you want to write me or get in touch with me, uh, you're welcome to do that. It's just go to the bottom and click on the alien hunter. and It'll email me directly. I answer all my emails. If I don't answer, it's because I didn't get your email. So do it again. So uh, if you're interested, uh, we got all kinds of film footage and all kinds of fun things on there, what we're doing. Uh, we're, we're doing a European tour, like I said, and it's going to start in Scotland and end up in uh, Manchester, England. And then we're going to, to uh, Istanbul, Turkey, Gobekli Tepe, Karan Tepe. And then next month after that, I'm going back to field one of the biggest conferences they've, they've ever had there. So a lot of fun. It's gonna be, it's, so I any, love it. All your so, events, whether they're, uh, you know, uh, in Europe or anywhere or here in the U S you do post them on your website though, right? I do post, uh, we will, we, we're going to hold off posting on the, the stuff on, uh, on the, the second conference because we, we're firming it up right now, literally. Okay. And then but, we, but, that but will all be on the site. Yes. All your events or whatever, as they come up, you post them on there so people could yes. find out about it and everything. Absolutely. Perfect. Again, thank you so much, Daryl. I wish you the best of luck, and we'll be talking soon because I have a feeling a lot of things are going to be happening. Very, very good. Very good. Take care. Okay, thank you. Bye. Wow. This is like super, <laughs> you know what? I know that a lot of people with the UFO things, it's, it's fun and you know, it's fun in a legend tripping kind of way. And there's another part of it, which is, you know, and of course there's people that have had their, you know, whether it's a sighting or abduction or suspicion of abduction or implants or, you know, for different people, it can mean different things. But the truth is, we really have to consider if the idea of an alien invasion could ever be used against us, as in, are we willing to believe it? Okay. And the reason why I say this is, you know, depending on which school of thought you come from, whether it's 70 years or whether they've been around for hundreds of years, if you you know, if you go to alien, uh, ancient aliens and, you know, all the ev evidence, you know, stuff that they produce, like, you know, was, are these sightings, whichever way you would think that if they were going to invade us or I don't know, let's, let's not use the word invasion. That's a loaded word. Let's go. If they wanted to make their presence known as in, we're going to become visible or I don't know, land or something, something that couldn't be dismissed that the government couldn't cover it up. How's that? I would think that they would have done it by now. I don't know. And, and of course, that always comes back to the original question. Are they friendly? Are they hostile? Or are they indifferent? You've, and then you go to people and say, well, there's more than one type. And some of them are just observers. Some of them are friendly as in protective. And then those are the ones, you know, sometimes a lot of times uh, described as reptilians, which are like out to get us and they kind of have a, a, a makeshift kind of agreement as in nobody, nobody's running the show, but I don't know. I, 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 I'm out on that one. I just think, I'm not saying that I don't think that there's UFOs or extraterrestrials. Believe it or not, I'm more concerned about the humans using extraterrestrials or invasions or that kind of thing against us. And we're so primed, let's face it. Back in the 50s and the 60s, if you look at all those sci-fi, you know, the Cold War and all that, and it was like, ah, uh, oh, okay, how, let's, 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 how prime can you be, you know, when, when you hear about that, you know, when Orson Welles did that War of the Worlds kind of deal where everybody in the radio is listening to what they think is a real transmission that we're getting invaded, okay, this is before the Cold War per se. And people were wigging out. People really, really, really thought this was real. Now, can you imagine? This was only based on, because back then, mostly people got their entertainment or their news on the radio. Now, can you imagine how much more susceptible we are to believing it if we've been watching on TV, watching it for years and years and years and years? Forget it. There's nothing. What was it? A, a picture paints a thousand words. How much more we've been inducted 
in our minds as far as not only the existence of extraterrestrials, but depending on what movie you've seen, and I'm not talking about E.T., um, you know, we're going to be on the short end of the stick. And that's to put it nicely, right? Where if we see something that looks like a spaceship or God knows whatever, I don't know, Godzilla, what God, we're going to be like, I knew it. They're here. Oh. You know what? And call me a, a cynic, but I, I don't think that's an impossible, that's an impossible thing. Because I'm thinking of all the things that really would just make everybody wig out across the board, it would be something like that as a, 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 um, a universal threat. How's that? This would be the kind of threat that, that forget borders and countries and governments that would make everybody like run for the hills, like be like, Oh, you know, because let's face it to us, we'd be like, Hey, as far as the aliens are concerned, we're all the same, <laughs> you know, humans, right? So we would be thinking we're all under the same pressure of that same threat. Because of course, I doubt very much. That, and this is something to consider, you know, that these aliens, they're going to come over and take only over one country. No, we're here. We're here to conquer just but that one country. Now, if they're, if they're here, we're going to assume they're here to take over the world if they look to be hostile. But even if they're not, let's say, let, let, let's, let's go with the, the uh, they don't make um, hostile uh, maneuvers how's that they're just like hey you're you know we're here we'd be wigging out just just to, just wondering where's this going to lead which leads me to as much as like i told daryl i wish I, I would get the truth like sometimes i doubt we ever will you know how like how deep is that rabbit hole I'm also wouldn't put it as far as well, Israeli life and it's here, how long, whatever, who are they, whatever. The other part of me is I would not want to be manipulated by the use of that into being shepherded and coerced into believing something and being put under martial law because, hey, the aliens are here. You know what? Three or four years ago, I would. I wasn't as cynical. Now I am that cynical. <laughs> take it for what it is, you know. Take it for what it is, and that, you know. And then again, if if based on what Daryl is saying, if if you've got a ship that's hundreds of miles in diameter or length or whatever you want to call it. I mean, what base are you going to put that on? You know, you could think, okay, this this thing doesn't really need a base here. It could be, it could base anything where it could be based on an asteroid. It could just, or you know, go behind the thing, and you know, it doesn't have to. Doesn't, in other words, it doesn't have to go in a hole in the ground. It doesn't go have to go underwater. All right, if something that huge, it could just like fly out into what beyond Mars. You know, hide on the other side of Mars or one of the planets or an asteroid or a moon and hang out there and just go, yeah, we'll be right back to or we'll be right back in five minutes. You know, again, that's the big question mark. All right, that's the big question mark that everybody has. And are we significant? Are we insignificant? What if there's no aliens at all? Or what if they were here and they already left? Wouldn't that be funny? You know, like that lady that she, yeah, okay, she had that implant that was like, what, 40 years old? <clears throat> this, like he said, it was, you know, outdated, outdated technology, maybe, you know. But for us, what if those aliens are gone? Psh, they hung out for 10 years, whatever, our time. Or what if they come back in, 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 How's this? What do they come? They do whatever they do. And they say, okay, you know what? We've done our samples. You know, we've looked at stuff. We're going to come back in 500 years and see what's happened in the 500 years. Why not? You know, we've gathered evidence. We've seen whatever the civilization is. This is the, the, the plant life, the animal life, the human life. This is what this, this planet, what's going on with this planet. 
the weather, the this, the that. We've taken all the samples we're going to take. All right. And basically, we've got everything labeled. So they leave and they come back. You know, they come back to say, OK, let's see what's happened in 100 years or 300 years or 500 years, or 1,000 years, depending on what they're trying to do. You know, what have what's happened? Is it still there? Did they progress? Or is everybody dead? You know, did they blow themselves up? You know, did this, did, did they summate? You know, what's happening? You know, or have they advanced? Hmm. Like I was telling him, long range studies are the best ones. Those are the ones that produce the best results, the most accurate results is long term studies. All right. So there you go, guys. There you go. Well, I hope you like to show with Daryl. I love talking to Daryl, man. Some of the stuff he comes up with is like, I love it. I love it because I I really like, because there's these tropes that float out there about different subjects. And let's go with the UFO, the abductions, the extraterrestrial. And there's some stuff that is the same people, same, same thing. And it's like, oh, come on, guys. You know, and then, then of course, they say it in hushed tones. And I like to hear from Daryl because he kind of like tells it like it is like, you know, because you always think, God, there's got to be stuff. And this is, and the way I look at it also is, let's say Roswell was in 47, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, of those original people that were in the military or in some type of intelligence agency or whatever they were in, I don't know. I think some of these guys are dying or dead or people that knew. You know, they're dead, they're dying, they're gone. You know, so unless you happen to be one of the people or persons that spoke to them and they said, look, this is what I know, keep it under your hat. Or, hey, you know what, I know I'm gonna, I'm gonna be gone, bye. But on my way out, I'm gonna let you know that this is what I witnessed 30 or 40 years ago. You know, yeah, yeah, we went out there, we recovered a, a craft. Yeah, I never heard of that in so-and-so place. Really? Where? I never heard of that. Yeah, of course you have it. Nobody knew about it. We knew about it. But the media would never found out about it. It was in the middle of nowhere. It was not really close to a town. Because that's another thing, folks. There's a lot of open space in the United States, especially even back. There's there's miles and miles and miles and miles of land that's unoccupied. In other words, that something could go down and there's no little town. There's nobody around to say, hey, I saw... You know, I thought it was an explosion or I came across debris. As a matter of fact, it's more than likely that that could happen. You know, something maybe they're tracking on radar goes down in the middle of nowhere, literally the middle of nowhere. They recover it. They take it, whatever it is. Nobody says there's no townspeople. There's no anybody. And the only ones that are there are basically the participants that originally were what with maybe the military or intelligence. You know, so unless you happen to be one of those people that decides that they're going to say something. And then I have my own theory on that, which is, you know what? If you're one of these persons that was ever witness to any of these things during your career and you have a family. And, you know, I heard a lot of these people will say, hey, you know what? Well, they're, I don't want to. I don't want to like ruin my career. I don't want to get kicked out or whatever ruined. Then after they, you know, besides maybe they've signed paperwork about non-disclosure or whatever. They're smart enough to know, you know, if they go after me, they're not going to go after me through legal means. Or they, you know, when they retire, they say, hey, you know, they'll, they'll mess up my retirement or whatever I've got going. I think also there's a certain innate fear that if you have a family, that they'll think, you know, if I ever come out and say anything, even if it's the end of my days, what if the powers that be, whoever the ones that told me, shut up, don't ever say anything, you're going to be fine, but keep your mouth shut. And when I mean shut, that means your wife, your family, your kids, nobody. In other words, you know these people aren't bluffing. You don't think that some of those people always, always do think, if I say something, let's say, hey, I'm, Pretty soon I know I'm going to be pushing up daisies. What if they start, these, things, these people say, well, you know what? This guy just said, came out on the show and said, I saw whatever. 
He's got kids. Yeah, how about his wife? Yeah, they're still alive. Do you think he talked to any of those people? Do you think he told them? You know, we thought this guy was never going to talk or say anything. What if he did? You know, when we, when we start watching them. This is just me going on my own little But If you don't think that sometimes some of these people that were involved in this field, whatever it is, do think about that. I think they do. I think unless you're a psychopath and you don't care about your family or your kids or your grandkids or your wife or whoever's left behind. I do. I think that they do think about that. They say, you know what? There's a lot I could say and things that I know. I could probably say things that all these guys that are running around on TV, you know, saying that they, you know, in Roswell, I, I saw the stuff that, that makes that look like, you know, a little kid's party. But I know that if I ever came out, even now, 50 years after the event, is it going to, is it going to mark my family? You know, maybe I, I, life has been sweet and I may, I'm sure maybe even they've been on and off monitoring, but since I've never said anything, they kind of like say, yeah, this guy's good. He's kept his mouth shut all these years. Yeah. We've overheard conversations. We've tapped his phones and I've never heard his wife say to her mother or her aunt, Hey, someone so said he went out to, you know, where, you know what they found? <laughs> We never heard that, so he's safe. But he knows that all he has to do is say something to somebody who publicizes it, and it's going to put all those people around him, wherever they might be, under the microscope, because they're going to say, oh, 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 who else did he talk to? Did he ever say any stories? Did he ever say any stories to anybody that said, hey, do not say anything until I'm dead or after I pass? How much did he say? And, of course, this all goes back to how much that person knows. How important is it of what knowledge they have? Because let's face it, if you if you are in some type of position that you are there to witness some type of recovery of a craft of communication, I don't know, whatever it is, call it whatever you want. A craft, uh, back engineering, uh, recovery of bodies, wherever, and, after a while, you're known for keeping your mouth shut. You, I, I imagine maybe after a while, you get taken out more and more to all these things. So, yeah, maybe the pool of knowledge you have is considerable and important. Yeah. yeah there's a lot of stuff that's been taken to the grave. Or there's a lot of stories out there left unsaid by family members, even good friends, that say, you know what? I would love to say this or talk about this and maybe humanity, but... Mm, it's not worth it because there's there's going to be some type of refer, repercussions for those people around me. There's a little paranoia for you, right? There you go. All right, guys. See you next week. I have a lot of interesting guests. Some great ones coming on. We'll talk a lot about interesting things. So until next time, take care.